Founders Field Notes, the podcast where you can learn from founders how to be a founder. I'm founder and CEO of Klugonics Group, Jason Klug. Welcome back to this week's episode, continuation of my interview with Kirk Wimet, who from last week's episode, you heard all about his hacking and his building and him learning that all the hustle and coding skills that he taught himself, how to make money off of it, how he built a brand with Garrett G which was known as Scan that sold to a company like Snapchat. And this week, we get into that dirt of that sale and how it happened and the excitement around it. And it's an exciting story. It's one of those stories they could have made a movie about. Maybe they still will. So hearing about the exit is exciting, but also another very exciting part is to hear about the project that I've been able to work on with him and learn from him as a founder. Basically, he just welcomed me in as part of the team and My company, Klugonics, has been working very closely with him on building what you're going to find out in this episode to be something that will become very massive in the supplement industry. He's solving a lot of problems that exist in the supplement industry, and it's a very complex platform and product that I cannot wait to continue to develop and see where it goes because it has a place in everybody's life. So without further ado, back to Kirk. Thanks for listening. So the deal closes, and then I go there. I had negotiated the crap out of that deal with our lawyers. That's and, great. And our and our lawyer, uh, Larry, mm-hmm. uh, from Goodwin Proctor, mm-hmm. he's a badass. That's great. And uh, and I had told Larry multiple times. Of course, Garrett's not on the phone calls. I, yeah, Garrett. Like, and that's one of the things that I learned about Garrett is Garrett can sell. He's in the but, front end, not yeah, the back end. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. when it comes to tactical and like hiring, managing all yeah. of that, like that's my strength. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to yeah. let Garrett be that's good uh, partners. Yeah, yeah. Just like perfect synergy between us. Mm-hmm. And so I go to Larry, and I'm like, the moment that this deal signs, I am uh, retiring. Mm-hmm. or quitting. I'm going to let Garrett and uh, the rest of the team move forward. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take a step back and I'm done as soon as the deal done, the deal is done, which means no vesting for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want, and like, I want everything up front. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I negotiated all that. And then Larry came in and made all of that happen for me. Wow. But you worked there at Snapchat, right? I know. I worked there for five years. So and, how did that happen? <clears throat> well, Garrett, Garrett did the opposite. Garrett didn't work there and you did. <laughs> well, I negotiated it for not only me, but also all the founders. It wasn't like okay. a specific deal for me. It was just mm-hmm. the deal for us. Yeah. And so what ended up happening is we get to LA. Garrett immediately realizes that working for a corporation is toxic to the human spirit. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. his especially. Yeah. And like, uh, and the idea of him going in and clocking in and then and then doing his hours it was just it did not mm-hmm. it did not work and i actually saw him like suffering yeah and i i at this point i had so much love for garrett it was like mm-hmm. it just hurts me to see you suffer mm-hmm. and then uh, i remember garrett talking to me and he was just like i feel like i, I don't think i can do this anymore how uh, long was that time frame? Like, how many? How long did you last? Like a month or something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, that's it's good to be self aware like that. That's yeah, impressive. That's yeah. hard to, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I talked to him and I'm like, Garrett, uh, I have good news. And for me, I was loving it because it was like mm-hmm. I was meeting like engineers and I yeah. was like, I was like, oh, this is actually freaking. You cool. like the resources you're surrounded Absolutely, by? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is like to be in LA and working at Snapchat. That actually interests me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for Garrett, it's killing him. Mm-hmm. Was so Ben I, there too? Uh, ben wanted to stay in Utah, and so okay. Ben stayed in Utah for like the first year, okay. and then he and then he eventually retired. Okay, I remember calling uh, calling Garrett, or we were talking in person, and I was just like, "I want you to you to know that the way that I negotiated this was, was so that I could leave." But you can leave, and you can get a hundred percent of everything. So you just swapped and filled in for him. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Garrett was like, "Oh my gosh, thank goodness!" And, and then so, he started the bucket list family. Yep, and then he that's went, incredible. Yeah, he went and did that, and then I stayed at Snapchat for five years. I ended yeah. up building an office for Snapchat in Utah. I ended yeah. up running a oh, big portion that. of the camera team, which is like what you open up to. Yeah, I ended up managing a team of over sixty engineers. Wow, and then I uh, was flying back and forth from LA and Utah, and honestly, like loving it. And yeah, that's awesome. I learned a massive amount from um, spending uh, weekly meetings with Evan and mm-hmm. watching the company grow. I was like, we were like employees. 60 ish. Yeah. And then the company grew to like 5,000 employees. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. So I was like able to witness you love that basically startup all the way through IPO. That's awesome. And everything. Serendipity and then, again. Yeah. And then five years in, like I just started to hit burnout mm-hmm. and I was like, I went to Evan and I was like, I, I've got to, 
I've got to be done. Yeah. And he was super cool about it. And I mean, you put that five years is a, is pretty solid. Yeah. 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 And so, so one of the things I noticed with when, you know, integrating scan with Snapchat was the QR codes they used for adding people. Yeah. The Snapchat. And they had the dots. Yep. You know, so that was that that was like the the big integration. Yeah. Evan right? wanted he didn't want a QR code, he wanted something that was his, which was is the snap code, yeah. yeah. With the little yeah. thing in the ghost in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And so we launched the snap codes uh well branded in the first maybe like six months of our acquisition, and mm-hmm. that ended up being huge. Yeah. Because uh the snap codes were scanned ten million times a day or so yeah. between the hours of eleven AM and one PM. Huh. And that was kids at lunch at high school yeah. adding each other. Well, and they're sharing their snap code on yep. social. Yep. So it has a little ghost yep. logo. In I remember it. we yeah. had the White House make their snap code and we yeah. had like wow. Barack Obama make his. And it was That's like, sweet. oh yeah, it was like nuts. It yeah. was like so cool. It's like, we made that and they're everywhere now. That was great. Yeah. So that's an awesome integration of scan. Yeah. 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 And then after that launch, then I went on to uh, focus on um, integrating music into Snapchat. Mm-hmm. And like uh, we acquired this company from Ukraine that came in and built the face filters, which did the augmented oh, reality. Which, yeah, that's So cool. we integrated with that. Wow. And uh, yeah, and it was just awesome. And then I had my my boss at Snapchat, a guy named uh, Rong, R-O-N-G, mm-hmm. uh, and I just learned a massive amount from him. And so I think those five years at Snapchat are just like really precious years. That's awesome. Yeah. What a what a great like chain of events. Yeah. And then, and then what? So five years hits and so, you're done. So did you go, did you go into a weird purgatory like Scott did? <laughs> you know? so, well, what I did is I, so then I retire and then I'm like, I'm going to just take a break, like mm-hmm. the equivalent Good. of a sabbatical. And I'd been redlining my life. I had, I had my two boys mm-hmm. uh, and they were what, like seven and five or six and four. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm going to spend time with the family. And then uh, about a month after I retired from Snapchat, like the pandemic hit. Oh yeah! Wow. Okay. Yeah, and so I didn't know that was it. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like planning on doing a lot of travel and just being free, and then, and damn it. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I was like, let me go join Garrett because like like Garrett had uh, Garrett had us out on a bunch of his adventures, and we had gone uh, shark diving and done a bunch of stuff. Like I'm like, let me go party with Garrett. He's learned the best spots in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the pandemic hit, and then uh, and then I think that led not only the entire world, but me specifically to start thinking a lot more about health Mm -hmm. and, and what is truly valuable. And that ultimately has led to this company that we're doing Mm -hmm. something like, I think the process of how we got to the point where I wanted to make stack was an evaluation of what is important in life. And so after I retired, I went through and I have a list, I'm sure like every uh, every entrepreneur does mm-hmm. a list of all of the ideas of things that we want to build or manifest and create in the world. Mm-hmm. And I looked at that list and I realized that the majority of the things in that list were projects to do for the sake of making money. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there's basically three things that we can choose to chase after. The first thing that is the most obvious and it's the one that we all want to that we all want to chase after is status. And so status comes in the form of uh, attention and, and uh, like being popular. Mm. So people want to, they want to be known for doing something. They want to be famous. And so I think that a lot of things that we can do can be for chasing after status. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my, one of our investors is a guy named Naval Ravikant. And Naval created a uh, company called Angelist. And Naval got oh, huge yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and Naval talks a lot about this. So you can you can choose to optimize for status and have that be a thing. That's something that I never in my life I never really focused on. Yeah, you stay behind the scenes. I stayed a behind lot the scenes, it, yeah. and and whereas like Garrett optimized for status, mm-hmm. and uh, and so th- the second thing that people can focus on is wealth, mm-hmm. which is um, how do I how can I make as much money and retain and hold as many assets as possible? Mm -hmm. And so I valued wealth over status. Mm -hmm. Uh, Status can create wealth and wealth can create status. They're kind of like uh, symbiotic in that way. Mm -hmm. But I prefer, I would prefer wealth. You'd always be heavier on one of the sides. Yeah. yeah, So for example, like one of the questions that I asked Garrett one day, because I always like to ask hypothetical questions is Garrett, would you rather have $20 million and nobody knows or one million dollars, and everybody knows. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's computing. That is like a no-brainer. Yeah, 
for me, uh, a twenty million all day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, like it's and fantastic. We're, and we're, we're tactical thinkers. Yeah, yeah. And Garrett's like one million, and everyone knows. And I'm like, why? And he's like, the fact that everyone knows is going to go let me make more than twenty million. Yeah, that's fair too. Yep. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm like, it just takes it. It's just more work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's an example of status and wealth. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I'm happy just to have that security and have money. This third thing started to come up, which is uh, something that is worth more than status and wealth, which is health. Yeah. And it's like, That's great. what does it matter if uh, the whole world knows you, but um, you're not healthy? Yeah. And what does it matter if you have unlimited money, mm-hmm. but you're not healthy? Mm-hmm. Um, health hey. is the ultimate. Health is wealth. <laughs> health is status and health is wealth. Yeah, health is enough. Health is everything. Yeah. Um, and that's something that's really cool with uh, Garrett coming in and being a part of this company as well. Is uh, he? And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that recent? No, that's been Did part the of AI the, tell you to do that? What? <laughs> no, I wanted to. <laughs> that's great. I wanted yeah, to. Yeah. So Garrett's, uh, Garrett's going to come in and he's already been advising uh, along the way. And that's the thing is like, I'm a very long-term thinker mm-hmm. and I, I like to play um, I mean, long-term with everybody. He's a healthy, fit guy. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Garrett is going to come in and help out. And it's like, can we focus our efforts and intention on creating a company that can help me, myself, be the most healthy version of myself mm-hmm. and uh, the world? Yeah. The richest person in the world would trade all of their money yeah. for health. Oh, yeah. And so... That's that was kind of like some of the foundational philosophical thinking of like uh, you can do any company, you mm-hmm. know. I'm sure that you and I could sit down and in 30 minutes we could create some uh, widget that we end up totally. selling and it yeah. is a five million dollar a year mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. But it's like why? Mm-hmm. What are we like? What's what are we really chasing? And it's like I want to create something that where I first and foremost am the customer, mm-hmm. um, and where me where it's for me and my family and my loved ones, mm-hmm. and I'm going to have a very high standard for that. And if that's good for me, then it should be good for everybody. Mm-hmm. Is the is the thinking? It's great. So then that's where stack comes. That's where stack comes. This is gonna be almost like an intro to stack, right? Yeah. Like it's it's. Um, early stage. Scott talked a little bit about it, but it'd be, you know, going through why it is the way it is, like what it entails, like high level pitch of what this company is all about. Other than, I mean, that's the, like the high level side of it, but what's the tangible thing? What is the customer experience that you're going to provide? And what is this that you're creating? Yeah. We have a master plan and uh, the master plan starts out really simple. Mm -hmm. And the master plan is uh, the thesis is, is that there is a set of vitamins, minerals, and molecules that we can take every single morning and night that if we take them should have in the short term and the long term, a tangible effect on our health, our immunity, our mental clarity, cardiovascular health, like all aspects of health is, is going to be a function of what chemicals we're putting into our body. And that's going to be a huge component of it. And so the initial idea for Stack is uh, we have no clue what that right mix is. And so that's a data science problem. Yeah, for every human, it's different. For every human, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And um, the majority of the current uh, providers of supplements in the world are just trying to sell one supplement Mm -hmm. and they're not taking a holistic view of the human body and they're definitely not incorporating data into it. And so you end up getting what looks like a lot of snake oil salesmen Mm -hmm. take this and this is going to be amazing for that. And so for me, I think the important thing to recognize is that the best thing that you can do for your health is to number one, sleep eight hours of good sleep a night minimum Mm -hmm exercise every single day with a mix of weight training and strength training and eat like healthy macro macros for your body mm-hmm. and uh, and also eat with a slight caloric restriction uh, and that's proven to be good for longevity and for health mm-hmm. those are all really hard to yeah. do and there's already companies that are focusing on helping you sleep better like I sleep on the eight sleep mattress mm-hmm. which is like temperature controlled so you can sleep better mm-hmm. uh, there's a bunch of uh, apps out there for figuring out how to fast there's mm-hmm. you have the tonal and all of the exercise equipment yeah. industry and all of that and so there's products that can come and help in that space and we'll eventually get get there 
But what we're focusing on in the very beginning is, is there something that I can take? Yeah. And most of the people who are like very health conscious are taking some type of supplement yeah. because they notice an effect on their body. And nutrition is very hard. Yeah. It's very hard to just use food to get everything you need consistently. Yeah. And there's, and not only that, there's like, it's actually impossible to eat a well-balanced diet enough uh, in order to get all of the positive health effects that you could yeah. because, uh, there are some molecules that just aren't pre present in our food. Yeah. And so there's molecules mm. like resveratrol and uh, NMN mm -hmm. and things like this that are being studied at these major universities that could have a very positive effect on our DNA replication. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't get that in your diet. Yeah. And so there's probably a whole subset of molecules that we don't know anything about mm -hmm. that are, if we took them daily would be uh, asymmetrically positive for us where it's like the downside of taking them is very low and the upside is potentially very high. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I always want to focus on my own exercise and health and that's always just a daily battle that everyone on the planet goes through of mm -hmm. committing to work out and all of that. And there's like a whole mindset around eating well and, and everything like that, which you, I want to continue to focus on and improve. Mm -hmm. But I also want to dive deep into like, this is actual, this is like a math problem that we can solve. Yeah. Like this is a math problem where we can look at it and we can look at data. And so Stack in the very beginning is going to be a connected health company. We deliver nutrients, vitamins, and molecules to you on a morning and evening basis. And we use all of the smart devices that everyone has now to create a feedback loop of how is this impacting you? Are you getting better REM sleep? Are you getting better deep sleep? Mm -hmm. Is your resting heart rate lower? Are you showing better metrics on what's coming in through your Apple Watch and through all of your smart devices? Mm -hmm. And not only that, can we get a sample size large enough where we can have hundreds of thousands of customers so that we can start A-B testing and seeing how are things affecting certain portions of the population mm -hmm. uh, that is taking this? And we can start to use data to identify what should be in this uh, mixture that we're all taking that mm -hmm. is going to be suited to our age, our uh, lifestyle, and our genetics. Mm -hmm. I think that it's going to take us, that's going to be a multiple decade long journey of figuring out what that is for everybody. But I think within about four years, we're going to have it dialed in pretty good. Yeah, you're going to like make it where you're just a daily part of everybody's yeah. routine. Yeah. And like as we're diving into it, I think like where we're starting is actually like from first principles, which is a lot of the times you're like, oh, I just take this, like I take vitamin D because I heard that's supposed, you know, it's supposed to be good for you. And it's like, yeah. actually the majority of people in the United States, uh, like over, you know, like we're talking like maybe 40, 50% are deficient in basic stuff yeah. because their diet isn't diverse enough. Yeah. Magnesium, calcium, mm -hmm. like very simple stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the problem doesn't need to be like overcomplicated in the beginning. Yeah, or maybe they, they can't get it because certain foods don't work with them and they're missing out on certain, yeah. you know, like dairy and yeah. stuff like that, right? Yeah. It's where it's, yeah. I mean, I me personally, I, I'm looking forward to when we get our first batch and I can be a daily user. Yeah. You know, yeah, which it's coming yeah. soon. Yeah, so we've been the, building this packaging system where it's going to be a, a easy for a user to remember on a daily basis to take their yeah. their stack yeah. and you know deliver it in a way where you don't have conflicting minerals and vitamins and all that stuff where you have the morning stack, the nighttime stack, so you get not only you get the most out of everything that's in each bottle. Yeah. Which is unique, yeah. right? And different. Well, there's a few things that we're <laughs> immediately doing just right off the cuff, which is one, we're going to reduce the amount of volume of stuff that you need to swallow. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of supplements are over 90% carbohydrate filler mm -hmm. versus active ingredient. Yeah. And this is something that I really want to demonstrate to the world and teach people about is just sizing. Yeah. And so there is this concept of like, all right, how much vitamin D do you need? Well, according to the National Institute of Health, you need uh, 20 micrograms of vitamin D, you know, yeah. give or take. Which is a tiny dot in a little how much is a microgram? capsule of oil. Right? How, much is, how much is a microgram? It's tiny. It's like well, the tip of a hair. <laughs> it's less than that. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So a microgram, let's just put it in perspective, one gram is one sugar cube. Mm -hmm. One milligram is one thousandth of a sugar cube. Yeah. So like and one so grain that's like maybe. A, like maybe a few grains. Yeah. And then one microgram is one one thousandth of a milligram. Yeah. So we're talking that one microgram is one millionth of a gram yes. or one millionth of a sugar cube. So the size of an ant's foot. Or something Less like than that. that. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Microscopic. Like yeah. you need a million dollar microscope to see it. Yeah. So you get the those those 
oil capsules for vitamin D and it's suspended yeah. in there somewhere. Yes. Hopefully. Yes. Like it might have missed it. Yes. You know, yes. how do you homogenize something so yes. tiny and something so big? And there's been and there's uh there's been accidents in the dairy industry where they've given people uh, 10,000x the amount of vitamin D by tipping the scale slightly wrong wow. uh, and injuring people with that. Like, oh my gosh. It is crazy. very, very tiny. And yeah. then you have to imagine that when you swallow vitamin D and you bring it into your body, it's going to start floating through your bloodstream. And it's like a little key that opens these uh, locks to very big doors and then kicks off a bunch of processes, mm. processes in the body. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we need these things, and if you consistently don't have them, then your body uh, is going to slowly deteriorate in all of the things that uh, requires it. So, for example, let's say that you're not getting enough calcium in your diet. Mm -hmm. Well, calcium is a fundamental building block to bones, and so over time, your body gets worse and worse at deriving calcium from your diet, and so slowly but surely, your bones start to demineralize, mm -hmm. and your bones become more bit brittle, and you develop osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And, and it's so, harder to come back from that. It's really hard to come back from that mm -hmm. because supplementation is a marathon. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going to take your supplement morning and night. Then you're and, fixed. <laughs> and, uh, and like in three weeks later, you're yeah. good. It's like, no, this is a, a pattern and a habit, a habit that I need to establish that I'm going to run over my entire life. Mm -hmm. And if I'm committed to this pattern of behavior, just like brushing my teeth, or just like daily exercise, mm -hmm. I'm not going to see the effects next week or next month, but it's going to be over the decades that I'm going to see, see these yeah. benefits, which is why the biggest problem that we need to solve in the very beginning is establishing a daily habit of taking vitamins. Yeah. And that is why packaging is critical. Yeah. It's the, about just as much about the user experience and what's of the bottles and the delivery yeah. than what it is yeah. in it. The thing that like... Most it's hard to get a habit when you have seven bottles and yeah. they're all different sizes and they're all, you know, and, and it's like the vitamin D you take every other day or whatever, yeah. for example. And it's like, you know, you forget it's hard to stay on top of that versus yeah. if it's like, oh, here's my morning. Oh, yeah. here's my night. You know. So I think what's really cool about what your team has constructed mm -hmm. is this um, packaging system that is in in itself the product. Mm -hmm. It's because the packaging, the way that it's put together is all built to simplify the experience of taking vitamins morning and night. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll know if you miss. You're going to know if you miss it. Visually. And we're going to try to make it as easy as possible for people to mm -hmm. open a beautiful capsule crack it open, mm -hmm. swallow everything that they need for that day, mm -hmm. um, recycle it, yep. and then at night, come back and do it again as part of their routine, just like brushing your teeth in the morning mm -hmm. and brushing your teeth at night, yep. uh, and make it as painless as possible. But then come in hard with on the data side and leveraging um, all of the advancements that we found in artificial intelligence to be able to say, specifically what does Jason best need on Monday morning mm -hmm. based on everything that we know about him? Well, we do know that Jason is, it's currently the month of January and the sun is in this position <laughs> and based on his activity mm -hmm. uh, and how much time he, we think he spends outside, he's probably sufficiently deficient in vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And so we probably need to uh, up his dose of vitamin D to from 20 micrograms to 40 micrograms. Mm -hmm. But then as summer comes, we're going to dynamically drop that back down because he's going to be spending more time in the sun. Golfing. Yeah, golfing. <laughs> whereas if... Because yeah. uh, it tracks my yeah. golf activity. Whereas I just track if, that, yeah. if you happen to have darker skin, mm -hmm. maybe we're going to up you up to 50 micrograms of vitamin yeah. D because your skin is going to have a more difficult time of absorbing uh, rays from the sun and kicking off that process of vitamin D synthesis. Mm -hmm. And so we got to do that for every single molecule. Yeah. And the, one of the things that we're doing is we're going to use pharmaceutical grade components, mm -hmm. uh, which means that we're going to be over 99% purity. The majority of the uh, existing supplement industry uses food grade, which is 80% pure. Mm. And so I want to be, um, I want to be psychotic about what we're bringing into our body, the quality of it and how we're bringing it in. And can you imagine what will be the outcome of the research that we do uh, and the supplementation that we give people over the period of 10, 20, 30 years? So much. We don't know. It's but incredible. If it yields a five-year increase in health span, mm -hmm. like let's say- That's that incredible. If five good years mm -hmm. is an, an insane upside. Mm -hmm. It's just like, 
It's, it's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then and then you, you th- between that time and the, the extra five years, you're going to live better and healthier and feel better yeah. daily. Anyway, you'll yeah. get better sleep, better recovery. Yeah, so on and so forth. So the, yeah. So the goal here is: can we? And one of and one of our core metrics that we're going to track as a company is: can we increase the health span of our customers? Yeah. And health span is different than lifespan. You can live a long time and and live in a pretty shitty, like f- yeah, f- like body that's yeah. like broken down and breaking down around and you might you. not know it necessarily yeah. until you know what it feels like to feel good yeah yeah which yeah. is something i've experienced when i was like overweight yeah. and i lost like 60 pounds and i the feeling the difference is huge was massive yeah like I, just my energy levels yeah. and everything so that's you know doing it at uh, you know for the masses is incredible yeah but you have to make it easy what you're doing yeah to digest the other thing that uh you know I see is interesting about it. I mean, you know, I know the the glamour of all of the the business and the 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 user side of it. The thing that is the exciting part to me is that it's like Elon Musk says about building Teslas. It's not about the car. Yeah. It's about the manufacturing. So there's gonna be some pretty intense stuff that is gonna happen to create a custom month for that custom day. Custom At night. day for a customer on a monthly basis we're that gonna evolves. Have to, we're going to have to innovate in the packing and filling in a way it's that hasn't be happened. Awesome. I need to be able to deliver you mm-hmm. five micrograms more of vitamin D than mm-hmm. another customer. Mm-hmm. And I need to be able to do that accurately with zero mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, every month, every day. Every, for every, every morning yeah. and every night. Because yeah. eventually, when we get to the level of customization that is going to be required to optimize your health span, mm-hmm. what you're taking in the morning on August 1st is going to be different than what you're taking in the morning on uh, February 1st. Yep. Um, and there are cycles in the body in both male and female. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are cycles that are happening that we need to understand and we need to know when you need more of something and when you need less of something. Mm -hmm. And my goal is we're going to optimize for reducing the total amount of volume of what you need to take and optimizing for the clinical effect. Yeah. So. Because most of those vitamins, they just put the max amount in there and just. Yeah. You know, or over, it's over do it and you end up peeing it out, yeah. you know, yeah. so. So that's like a big thing about like the way that we've formulated our product is we're using um, the latest in pharmaceutical techniques to do time, time uh, and sustained release of vitamins mm-hmm. that are specifically releasing in the small intestine mm-hmm. where they're not being filtered out uh, yeah. by the kidneys and, uh, and not being destroyed in your stomach. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the things that we're really focusing is, on is wrapping these supplements in a fiber shell where the pH uh, does not react with your stomach acid, but only reacts and, and uh, opens up in the small intestine. Mm-hmm. And so we've got to use the latest in pharmaceutical delivery, the latest in dosing, the latest in packaging in order to really solve the problem. Mm-hmm. And then the problem that we're solving for our our golden customer is going to be someone who has 20 bottles of pills where they are trying to make a best effort to take stuff into their body for their health, but they're just confused by the a massive amount of noise in the marketplace. Yeah. And so that was me. I ended up having 20 bottles of vitamin A, K, D, B, C, all of it. It's like I'm taking it. I'm choking on Costco pills. Yeah. My wife is giving me the Heimlich maneuver in the yeah. living room because I'm choking on an enteric coated omega three thing from yeah. Costco. The the other interesting thing to me w- that that you were talking about were uh, and people most people would not know this that some your body could only absorb some minerals solo. And then when you combine another vitamin or whatever in there, it prevents it from absorbing one or the other. They compete with each other. That's magnesium and calcium. Yes. And they are both going to fall into the same key slot. Mm -hmm. And so if you take both at the same time, Mm -hmm. then you're going to get roughly half the absorption. And likely people won't know that. Nobody knows that. They're going to take their supplements and then they're going to take their other supplement and not realize that they're not even getting it because of that. And so we can solve that problem using delayed release where mm-hmm. you can take it and we give you a four hour sustained release of calcium. Mm-hmm. And then at the four hour mark, we d- then do a delayed start release on the magnesium yeah. and let that run for four hours. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to worry about anything. You just, all yeah. that I have got is I've got a morning and evening pattern that you're on where you're, I'm going to swallow my stack in the morning. I'm going to swallow it at night. Mm-hmm. And however the timing needs to be, 
you guys have it figured out with your technology. Yeah. And so I think that'll be, uh, that'll be something that really differentiates us. Yeah. And we're getting patents on that. Making it easier for yeah. everybody. Yeah. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about deeply is who needs our product the most and, uh, and who is our initial customer after thinking deeply on it, the people who need our product the most are the elderly. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think this will play into the packaging, but elderly people need, like our parents, mm -hmm. they need this way more than uh, yeah. we do because their bodies and their metabolisms uh, provably over time are not good at getting all the things they need, which mm -hmm. is why you start to develop osteoporosis mm -hmm. and things start to get worse. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, We've got to figure out a way to make sure that um, the older generation, if you're over 60 years old, how do we make something really easy for you? Mm -hmm. And what, the other thing that's interesting is as you get older, people uh, start to report increased amounts of dysphagia. Mm -hmm. And dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how can we make this easy for you to swallow, easy for you to bring into your body and incorporate it into a routine? So right now we're in the process of getting a government grant to research this. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting, we're going to get a cohort of elderly um, individuals who are going to be taking our product, and we're going to be measuring blood vitamin uh, serum levels mm -hmm. before and after taking our product. And I think a lot of supplement companies are like, we're going to slap on the this is not approved by the FDA, mm -hmm. and we're just going to try to sell bottles. And I want to take the opposite approach, and I want to be like, this is something that the FDA would say is valuable and we should do it. I don't want to run away from FDA approval. Yeah. I want to run towards it. And I want mm -hmm. to say, let's prove that our stuff is working. And if it's not working, let's not make people take it. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're not, we're not engaged in this thing of just trying to sell something to try to sell something. We're actually sincerely and authentically engaged in solving the problem. Yeah. Which is why you're poaching doctors actively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think that that message resonates with a lot of people, which is like, Yes, I do feel like I'm not sure if my supplements are doing anything for me, and they add up. Mm -hmm. And so the average American spends over two hundred sixty dollars a year on supplements, mm -hmm. um, and like that's that's money that's all going towards things that are pot potentially not specifically optimized for them. They're just peeing it out, and they're just peeing. It's expensive urine, yeah. is what a lot of nutritionists will say. Yeah. And it's like I have to agree with you. And I've heard my wife say that so much with yeah. you know our marathon training and stuff. Yeah, I think it, follow up episodes are going to be interesting, especially if we get closer to like the official launch and yeah. stuff like that. Because the you know that's the intro of the company. Yeah. You know, next time we chat, it'll be interesting to talk to the meat of it you know, what yeah. you've gone through in the development and stuff like that and how you got to where you're, how you got to launch and stuff like that. Now, thinking back to the the chain of events we just talked about from you making um, software, and, you know, on your first computer and stuff like that to to now, what are some of those main things that you've learned throughout the, uh, that that you would tell or do tell new founders that you interact with? And what are those field notes? Yeah, oh, the field notes? Yeah. That's the whole point of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think the biggest thing is why did I get millions of visitors to my website? Mm -hmm. uh, it's because uh, Dig was huge at the time and a major uh, distributor mm -hmm. of links on the internet. Mm -hmm. How did we get 100,000 installs on Scan? Mm -hmm. uh, we got there because the iPhone had just got to the point where there was a camera good enough and a processor good enough to be able to optically take an image and look for a QR code in it and not like brick your phone in the process of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think the field notes are, what are the trends that are happening and, um, and how can you be an early participant in those trends? Mm -hmm. And so the trend that I am looking at now, and when I say trend, I'm, I'm not implying like, oh, this is something trendy. That'll blow What over. I'm implying is what, are, what is the latest in technological advancement mm -hmm. uh, that, that you can build a product for that is mm -hmm. going to leverage that latest advancement. Mm -hmm. So the internet was just link sharing in the beginning and then, it, and then it became this iPhone and this distribution of the app store where everyone has a phone that they're carrying around. Mm -hmm. And the trend that I've been watching the most closely over the last few years um, has been this trend towards creating these neural networks or artificial intelligence mm -hmm. where we've created a new way to be able to solve problems in computer science that has never been able to be done before. And mm -hmm. it's start and it's and things are going to be done at a level where um, the output of these computer programs that are not 
traditional programs, but mm-hmm. our artificial intelligence models is going to be potentially one of the largest leaps forward in technology in the history of humanity. Mm-hmm. And so to have to be at the precipice of us approaching general artificial intelligence, where our computers are actually smarter and more creative than us, Mm -hmm. and to not leverage that, like it's unacceptable to me. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're witnessing and seeing happen with artificial intelligence is with the release of GPT-3 and all of these other large language models, we're starting to see that AI is actually one of the best copywriters, Mm -hmm. like really good at writing text. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then with the release of Stable Diffusion, this latest AI model uh, that lets you generate images, you're realizing that AI is going to become one of the best artists. Content makers. Yep. yep. And Mm -hmm. and we already have AI uh, diving into the realm of music and being Mm -hmm. able to create music. Mm -hmm. And right now it's a baby at all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, how I want to incorporate this in the stack is um, if the AI is the best at talking and mm-hmm. the best at drawing and the best at creating music and singing, that's where it's trending. Mm-hmm. Like you, that is obvious to me at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, the AI will be the best doctor in the world. Yeah, and especially if you're able to give it biological data, it, all that, the blood, and all stuff that like artificial that. intelligence needs mm-hmm. to do its job is raw, da- raw mm-hmm. data in, a, in a, a clear question and a clear question. Yeah. And I want to, on behalf of myself and all of our customers at Stack, feed all of this information mm-hmm. into uh, an artificial intelligence model mm-hmm. so that it can predict quickly and accurately what things we need to do and change in our life. Like every time, I, every time I've gone to the emergency room or to urgent care, they always ask, who's your primary care provider? Mm-hmm. I don't have a primary care provider. And I'm guessing that most people don't mm-hmm. because the model of the doctor-patient relationship is fundamentally broken Yeah, because it's like getting uh, your car fixed. Yeah. It's like you got to go in when there's a problem. They want to reduce the amount of time that they have to talk to you so that they can increase the amount of bodies that go in and out yeah. of the door. And it's like, I'm not, my body's not... A computer that I should come to you when it's broken. If I come to you and my body's broken or there's some problem, yeah. that probably should have been addressed from the original onset that yeah. was maybe developing years ago. Where the oil changes, right? Yeah. Like for our bodies. Yeah. You know? And so if we had a thoughtful and um check engine lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we had a thoughtful intelligence that was watching over us whose primary goal was to increase our health span and our health, Mm -hmm. and it knew everything about us, Mm -hmm. um, then I think that that can have a massive impact on us. So Mm -hmm. we're, uh, so at Stack, we had this huge discussion at the beginning of the company. Are we data-driven? Are we design-driven? And like, which one are we? Because those are two different approaches. Yeah. Uh, The data-driven approach is, all of our decisions are going to be made based on the data that uh, our company collects. This is uh, Facebook, like Mark mm-hmm. Zuckerberg playbook, mm-hmm. which is, I don't care what the users say they want. They, set, they spend more time in the Instagram feed when I uh, uh, use artificial intelligence to rank that. Mm-hmm. And even though they're asking for a chronological feed, they don't spend more time in it. Yeah, and no the fact one has that they, time to go through a chronological yes. feed. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. like we're going to get people lost in an algorithmically ranked feed, and that's... Uh, and that's our decision. Our product decisions are based on user data. Yeah. That's data driven. Design driven is more or more of maybe the Apple approach where taste is involved. So it's like maybe a better example is like Google, when they were trying to pick the color of blue they used for links, mm-hmm. uh, they ran an AB test and they ran or multivariate test and they did something like they checked 48 colors of blue or whatever. Mm-hmm. The, nu- the number doesn't matter, but it was like, sure. whichever color of blue is clicked on the most is the right color because that's what the data says. Mm-hmm. And then Apple comes back uh, and the Apple perspective is like, we're going to pick this color of blue because as a tasteful human, it, me- it meshes well with the other colors mm-hmm. on the website. And over time, it'll become the the better clicked. <laughs> yeah, well, <blue>. I think that <laughs> right. I, I think that I honor both approaches. Yeah, I'm like, I yeah. think that's interesting that yeah. we do data driven. I think it's interesting that we use human taste driven. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what we've decided for our company is that we're going to be AI driven, mm-hmm. which is uh, if artificial intelligence has the best perspective and it's built in an organic human way, but it also has all the data, mm-hmm. it should be give us the best of both worlds. Yeah. 
And so when it comes to our founding principles as a company and what our product decisions are and how we create our formulas and what information we deliver to our customers, Mm -hmm. all of that is going to be led and guided by AI. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that is going to be a winning strategy, just like getting an app on the App Store right when iOS became a thing Mm -hmm. is going to be a winning strategy. Yeah, Pay attention to trends, and you you live by that with one of the trends being all the the ability of AI to feel out a bunch of data and give a a well-calculated response to your specific question. Yeah. The trend that is going up where we're exponentially increasing is Mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. So if you are at a company Mm -hmm. uh, or starting a company that- Or in a literature class and you need to write an essay by tomorrow. Yes. 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 (laughs) Uh, And we could, I could rant about that for a long time. But if you're not thinking about how artificial intelligence, and maybe you're like, I don't have the technical uh, sophistication to Mm -hmm. create my own and train my own models and use those. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter. How do you use the tools that other people people are building. Yeah, as you say there's digestible stuff out there right now you can get in and play with yeah. and learn from. Yeah, last night we're I'm in the process of building this ad mm-hmm. for uh for the first the first ad for our company mm-hmm. and I was meeting with my friend Zane who's going to help us do it mm-hmm. and I opened up um chat gpt mm-hmm. and i was like let's have chat gpt come up with our script mm. and i said please give us a script for this and i provided the uh what we wanted and then you know instantly it spits out a script and zane's mouth just drops and he was like uh a huge portion of my job is now obsolete <laughs> and i was like zane don't look at it like that yeah. Now, you can do more. Now you can do way more. Yeah. Now you can it, create a script and be a tastemaker and select the best script that it comes out with. Yeah. Ask it thoughtful questions to improve that. Mm-hmm. And this is like a superpower. Yeah. Like you should not be afraid of this. You should embrace this 100%. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Okay. What other, what other, uh, do you have any other? specific tactical, yeah. you know, things that you, you know, like thinking about when you were going through negotiation for the buyout, when you, or, you know, things that you would have done differently that you've learned and you don't do anymore, or thinking about, I think I, I you know, mistakes a, that you look yeah. back at and be like, you know what, I, I wish I did it this way. It's like, there's like a stat that it's like, the majority of the reasons that a startup fails mm-hmm. is because not because the idea is bad mm-hmm. and uh, not even because the execution is bad. Mm-hmm. It's because of co-founder relationships. Yeah. And so that like you having a poor uh, relationship with your co-founder mm-hmm. is more likely to kill your company than your idea being bad. And you know, I have experience with that. <laughs> I don't know. In the past. <laughs> yeah. So what that means, like, and maybe I think the most important field note is I gave Garrett this test called the Big Five test. And it's a personality test. You can find a free apps that do it. Mm-hmm. And you can learn about um, you can learn about people's personalities. And so it, to me, it's worth an afternoon of research yeah. to say, okay, I'm gonna give you the big five test and it's gonna show me where your values lie. And where your uh, personality is, and why the Big Five test is so important, is because it is the test that has the best retestability. Mm-hmm. So if I use it to measure your personality now, and you take it again ten years later, it's like maybe a ten or twenty percent difference. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, and so it's very consistent. Mm-hmm. And I wish that at the beginning of my company, I would have given Garrett and Ben the Big Five test and said, okay. Now we know what we are. Yeah. And now Stay we Stay in your lanes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now we know how we are. We know that Garrett likes to uh, be uh, this way. He's very open to change. He wants to try new things. He's incredibly creative mm-hmm. uh, and he's very extroverted. Like I, now we know that Ben is very introverted and highly conscientious. That means that if he says something, he's going to do it. Mm-hmm. And he's also pretty disagreeable, which means that we can expect that when we're having conversations, he's going to say, He's going to voice his opinion and say, no, I don't want to do that. And there's value in that. Mm -hmm. Because if we have everyone be too agreeable, we're going to end up making dumb decisions because we're Mm -hmm. not questioning why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And so instead of being mad at Ben when he's being disagreeable, you understand him. You can be like, oh, this is actually a strength here. Mm -hmm. And so understanding understanding your business partners Mm -hmm. and what their goals, motivations, aspirations, and personalities are is probably one of the most critical things to a company's success. Um, at the uh, at the onset. I mean, I validated that myself exactly. I totally agree. Yeah, and that's like, especially when you know, I'm realizing that I'm like a better 
solo founder on stuff or, you know, which is not necessarily the best thing either, you know, but looking back, it's like, yeah, when finding a co-founder, it's a tough thing to do. It's like more, it's, it's almost like deeper than dating yeah. in a way where it's like, you have to, you're going to enter into a financial relationship with someone. Yeah. Uh, and then you bring on team members and how yeah. they interact and the culture that they, they want. I mean, all those yeah. variables are like, yeah. they could be pretty intense yeah. and difficult or they could be amazing yeah. together yeah. Where, where there's like good balance. So, so now I've taken, um, with this new company mm -hmm. and I've taken everything that I've learned mm -hmm. about personality mm -hmm. and strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I have created an Olympic level team. Yeah. I've noticed of people yeah, it's been cool. to work with. Yeah. I took my first engineer mm -hmm. that I hired mm -hmm. and brought onto the team as a co-founder. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. John Paul, right? That was, so John Paul is our first scientist. Oh, got it. Okay. But our first engineer, Bill. Yeah. I met him at Snapchat. He's worked at me. He worked for me at Snapchat my entire time at Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you already know you work well together. Oh, I already know that I work yeah. well together with him. And not only that, but he was, he graduated top in his class in math, uh, mm -hmm. in China Wow! at the best school in China. Wow. So I literally have That's intense for one, <laughs> yeah, for at least one year of all of China's mathematical student output. Yeah. I have the best mathematician. That's incredible. And, yeah. uh, and you're going to need it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Bill has already written so much, uh, good infrastructure software for mm -hmm. what we're going to build. Yeah. And I just have a conversation with him and I tell him this every week. I'm like, Bill, I'm going to ask you to code the most difficult things that can be coded mm -hmm. by, by a human being. And he gets excited. And by he gets it. excited about Love that. Yeah. yeah. And he's ready to, and he's ready to like tackle really difficult problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one thing that's nice is when you're building a company, not out of scarcity, because it's like, we don't need to do a company. We can just be, we can just go travel the world or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're building a company, because you want to build a company and picking and putting together that dream team of people that you are just excited to see every day and excited to catch up with and talk with, and you know, are good at their job mm -hmm. and are better than you in every domain that you want them to be better than you in mm. is I think going to be the thing that sets our company up for success more than anything else. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. So well, interview your, give your co-founders a personality test mm -hmm. so that you can empathize with them when they're being shitty. Yeah, that is fair. <laughs> that's, that's totally fair. That'll probably save you. you that'll make you a lot of their money. Motives. Yeah. Well, that's been, this has been great. So, yeah, dude, thanks for coming on. Yeah, that was even a blast. Though, even we are, Let's do this again we when we have need. a product. Let's do it. It'd be interesting to go through, you know, chronologically this, you know, everybody knows where we're at right now, right? You're kind of in the um, pre-launch, you know, you've determined what your first product is. Yeah. You have a, a mindset for the future of the product and how it's going to evolve. Yeah. We have a target and, and a timeline to get the first product to market to where you're going to start acquiring customers and building. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to reconnect on this when you are in the process of acquiring the customers yeah. and what you're learning from the acquiring those customers and how it shapes what comes next. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, there's theoretically, you have a lot on what's next. Yeah. But, you know, you, we both know that'll evolve when you have 100,000 customers and, yep. you know, the, where the rubber meets next. the road when we're delivering packages mm -hmm. and getting returns and customer service yeah, and on a monthly basis. Feedback. Like, mm -hmm. but I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Like, so we'll keep an eye out for stack. Yeah. We'll, we'll make sure everybody knows yeah. as many as we can, at least. We're yeah. not that big of a deal. So, yeah. awesome. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Anytime ton of uh, takeaways from this. Obviously with a seasoned entrepreneur like this, there's just so much information that you can learn and, you know, hearing stories of their mistakes and their successes and the, the little tidbits of things that they did that, that made that success happen or, you know, made that mistake happen. So you don't make the same mistake. Kirk had a lot of them and it was great to, to hear it. And for me to spend the time to just sit here with him and get to know him even more. Because obviously we spent a lot of time talking and working on his project and, you know, getting to know each other in that sense. But when you get to sit with someone like this and, and dig into the roots of their story, a lot comes out. And I walked away from that learning so much and it was very enjoyable to chat with him. One of the big takeaways that, you know, obviously something that I totally agree with, because that's what we do is, you know, just show up and build something, you know, early on in his, is you know, professional life or even pre-professional life when he was a kid, he's just showing up and teaching himself how to code and just building stuff, whether it was for gaming or whatever. 
and building these websites. And he kept trying and building these things. And eventually some of these things started hitting and pe- tons of people started going. But at the end of the day, if he didn't take the initiative to build it, you know, none of that would have happened. So obviously people come to me and they want to build something, you know, and I, I hear it all the time. And some people, you know, might have a lot of ideas and they keep churning through lots of ideas and that's fine, you know, as long as you're continuing to entertain them. But, you know, you don't jump on every single idea. If you did it, all of us would be burnt out and we'd have, wouldn't have enough bandwidth, but, you know, eventually you find an idea that you want to stick with. And if that's the case and you're stoked about it, then just dive in and do it. You have to show up and build it. And obviously that's work for Kirk. And I mean, it works for us every day because that's all we're doing is building stuff every day. So show up and build it. Another thing that I totally agree with is, you know, don't put a paywall between you and your users. You know, I mean, obviously if you're selling a physical product, they have to pay to get it. But if it's something like an app or, you know, I hate those like online games where you download it and it's just filled with ads and stuff like that. And you're, you end up spending 75% of the time playing ads or watching ads instead of playing the game. I think that's annoying. Um, Technically there's no paywall there. Um, but it's like an, just an ugly barrier, but also, you know, if you're building a tool that's online, like he's talking about, he wouldn't have had, you know, all those tens of thousands of people showing up on their website or, or scan as an app, you know, like that was a free download. The value that they had was the fact that people could show up and download that app for free. And that's how they got the, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users. And if they had a paywall there, they would have had a very different story. So something as simple as like that and a tool that's that valuable. And if you're the, com- the the company side of things, it's the value is the data and the value is is the information you get out of it. Don't add a paywall. Let them in, let them use it, you know, and figure out how to sustain your life in other ways. And in, in their case, it was fundraising, which is one way to look at it. You know, I do see that as like different than w- what I do, but, you know, the way he explained it, you know, and obviously showed it to be successful makes sense. So it's something to consider if you're building software, building an app, how can you build it and get, you know, as many users as possible without a paywall, you know, get those users and find other ways to monetize it. Or if you're lucky enough like them, maybe you can just sell it before you have to charge anybody. Another great point. As soon as you have that J curve in sales or user, you know, and downloads and so on and so forth, those spikes are great opportunities to fundraise. You know, if you walk into an investor, you show a flat line or just steady flat growth, you know, they're, they're going to listen to you and, and maybe there's a reason for them to invest. But if you show them a graph that all of a sudden has a massive spike and there's a ton of momentum and justifies the fact that you, you're going to need more money. Oh, we need to hire more team to expand this or uh, we need to build on this momentum and, you know, here's what we're going to do because of how, you know, from building on this momentum, you know, it makes sense. Use those opportunities, look for those spikes and those, those, uh, change in momentums. And, and that's when you go fundraise or that's when you go and have conversations to sell the company. Another great point is, you know, the relationships that you have with your co-founders is extremely important. And I've learned from working with Kirk, uh, you know, he brought me in as a, as a partner and advisor for his new company stack, which you heard about in the podcast and which is extremely generous. But the thing is, is because he brought me in like that, I am extremely motivated to make sure that I could do whatever I can to make, you know, make the company successful with him. And in my part that I can really add the value that he needs to make sure that it's successful. But he's got this open and, and, you know, friendly mentality and, and, attitude towards working with people and collaborating with people. You know, he, he's almost treating everybody that, that I've interacted with that he's bringing onto the team as a co-founder. And I could see the, the value of the relationship that he has with all those people is extremely important to them. And what I see that happening there is this drive and this excitement and this passion towards the project. And I could see, you know, why the relationships with your co-founders is so valuable, but also when it's a one-on-one co-founder like him and Garrett, you know, it's extremely important for them to figure each other out and understand each other and their needs and so on and so forth. Because as people go through life, the lives change and, you know, things happen and you might have to, you know, like when Kirk had to stay in California because Garrett didn't want to do it anymore. Kirk said, you know what? I got this. You go home, do your thing. 
I'll stick around and work this. I like this, you know, and, and that's, that's a big move and just such a, a good friend move that he did there for, you know, the company and, and for them. So I appreciate that. And, and, you know, figuring out that dy- dynamic between co-founders, sometimes it doesn't work, you know, and I've experienced that and sometimes it does. Um, but really at the end of the day, understanding it. So, you know, if it's not working or when it's working or how to continue to make it work, I, I think it's very important to making that business that you're co-founding extremely successful. So I thought that was a great point. And it was cool to hear it from a, a story about that with, with scan from the beginning to the end. And then it's really interesting to see how Kirk is already starting stack from day one with a lot of the similarities of how he interacts with people and treats co-founders, you know, with stack. So a lot of great things. And it's really pretty validated because obviously Kirk has done very well for himself and has built a lot of amazing things. So I feel like this is quality information. You should take it to heart. So that being said, thanks for listening. Stay tuned for next week. We've got another founder. Thanks for listening, watching, or however you're digesting this. Check this out on all the social media platforms, Founders Field Notes, Klugonics Group. See you soon.